probably about 40-50% of cancers are preventable by us changing our lifestyle or the way that we eat or, the, or, or how we exercise or the environment that we live in. Welcome to the Flippin' Health Podcast, where we turn medicine on its head, flip it upside down, shake it all about and see what comes out. We're going to challenge convention and change medicine for the better. Hello, I'm Grant Schofield. And I'm George Henderson. Welcome to the Flippin' Health Podcast. Grant Schofield here with Richard Babor. Hey, Richard. Hi, Grant. Thanks Who are you and what do you do? Um, I'm an upper gastrointestinal and um, weight loss surgeon at County's Monaco DHB. And uh, I've been doing that for the last 10 years. I'm also a part-time TV presenter and we've recently collaborated, uh, Grant, on a show that we made called How Not To Get Cancer and had a, quite a good little segment on exercise for cancer prevention. Love the show. Um, Thanks. I particularly love that you cut me well, so I looked much better than I yeah, am in real cool. life. Mm. So we'll talk about that coming a bit later, but mm. what I'm inquisitive about is when you're a surgeon, like there's a whole world that someone like me looks at half in awe and half just scared of imagine what that would be Dream. like yeah, well, well, not that I want that surgery, but even just having to do that to someone, you're in the gowns, you're scrubbed, you've got the machines, you've got blood vessels and scalpels. What, is, what does a day look like? So um, I do upper gastrointestinal surgery, and that's mainly surgery on the esophagus, stomach, and uh, pancreas, sometimes a small bowel. And generally it's quite complex surgery technically, so some of the operations that I do might take all day, just one patient. And so when I have a case like that, it's usually fairly, my schedule is fairly simple. I've got one case on my list, but um, uh, we'll, we usually start at eight o'clock in the morning. Um, and often there's complex anesthetic kind of uh, preliminary stuff. And so I don't really get started till 9.30 or 10. It's taken me a long time to train to do, to get to this kind of level of complexity of surgery. And so like, it's very hard to explain it to people who don't have like a medical background or you know um, some idea of anatomy or physiology or surgery and, and most of the time uh, I'm not doing surgery in fact it's another thing so like a lot of surgery is not actually operating I operate maybe two days a week maybe one and a half days a week most times and the rest of the time I'm doing stuff like ward rounds or teaching registrars or teaching medical students or doing administrative work or going to meetings and planning stuff and mm. seeing patients in clinic or thinking about what I'm going to do to a patient in terms of the surgery that they need or tests that they need. Okay, but, but, you, but, you, but basically it all revolves around thinking about surgery. Pretty much, that's uh, my or, job. Or post-surgery or training others and that sort of thing. Yeah, that's the sharp end of my job, yeah. is actually operating. Yeah. And it's but, probably the bit that's sort of the most challenging. Yeah. So there's got to still be a first time you actually you actually cut a person open. Oh yeah, there is. Does that yeah. stick in your mind? Um, well, kind of, you know, like I remember, and I can, I can kind of, um, I hear what you're saying about that sort of feeling of dread because I do remember when I first started training in surgery and I've been through medical school and done my kind of house surgeon jobs and you know we mainly doing paperwork and listening to people's chest with a stethoscope and stuff and then you come to this part maybe two or three years in being a doctor where you might for the very first time be expected to take someone's appendix out right yeah and actually taking that knife and and making an incision into another person is quite a weird sort of sensation and, and a responsibility like what is where you're feeling with that what are you even thinking well yeah because i mean this is a living breathing person that's um for some reason richard has decided that his uh, cell phone sound is the sound of a loud animal it's a humpback whale a humpback whale yeah. i thought I wondered what, that was. Like what brought that on i oh, just like whales i like the and humpbacks are kind of Freaky whales, aren't they? Yeah, that loud sort of groaning yeah, noise. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, well, there you go. I didn't even know there was such a, a ringtone. <laughs> <laughs> Folks, you, can, you can look that up. The, yeah. The humpback whale. But now, now I get, you know, like that, that sensation is actually 
I get that different ways now yeah. as well. Like there's just a real feeling of dread that I get sometimes when I approach a difficult case where I know there's a tumour that I have to resect and it's close to some vital structures like the portal vein or the hepatic artery. There's, there's actually a chance of something something going yeah. wrong here. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And this person is kind of completely dependent on me, I guess, actually, yeah. and it usually is just me because yeah. the, the, you know, the registrar or training surgeon that's helping me oftentimes is in a little world of their own. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> and ultimately, it's, it is my responsibility. Yeah, sometimes we get into some um, quite scary territory where literally someone's life might be in my hands and we might be millimetres away from some critical structures. Yeah, on the other hand, you've got the ability to, to actually really help these people. Well, that's right. That's why we do it. I mean, yeah. and, and actually... I mean, the, the kind of cancers that I deal with are actually quite bad cancers. They often have quite a bad prognosis. And even if you do surgery on people, often um, the risk of recurrence is quite high. But it's um, not always that way. And actually, you know, particularly in young patients with curable mm. disease, I think that's a really satisfying area that uh, I get a lot of gratification from. How, how do you even decide that you're going to go to medical school and be a surgeon? How does that even happen? Well, I kind of feel, I, I mean, I, it wasn't any sort of dri driving kind of force that I always knew that I wanted to be a doctor, etc. And I'm not one of these people who's, I don't know, has a kind of a faith-based uh, um, motivation for that kind of thing, which is quite common. Yeah. But... I mean, I was good at science and maths and stuff at school, so that was one thing. And my mum's from a family of doctors, and she was quite keen on the idea, and I didn't really have any other strong <laughs> strong, <laughs> thing. strong, thing drove me. And yeah. so, you know, I kind of agreed to do that and, and, and gave it a try, and actually it turned out that it was, like, really interesting. The, the university course was interesting, and so I kept on with it, and then suddenly six years later you kind of pop out the other end you know and and as my education in medicine and career have progressed I've found it progressively more interesting and more challenging and so I guess that's what's kept me in it and and also that those other that other aspect that I just touched on with you is that you know it is gratifying to be able to help people and yeah. it's sort of when often when they're in a quite a desperate tight corner in their lives and, and to be able to extract a good outcome out of that is that's cool. very satisfying, yeah. And so then you've... Which doesn't always happen, by the way. And so that's one of the difficult aspects of it because sometimes things go wrong and things don't go right and things people have disease that can't be cured and they get complications or progression and that sort of stuff. And so there's that aspect of it that is also challenging and um, tricky. And do you think surgery will be radically different in you know, 100, 200 years' time? We're going to look back at this surgery and go, wow, how come there wasn't the computer doing it or something? Well, probably. Yeah. Probably like many things. You yeah. know, like, I mean, as, as you know yourself, the technology seems to be progressing at an exponential rate. So you know, if you look back on surgery that was done even 30, 40, 50 years ago, some of those things are kind of obsolete. Some things have been have stayed very true and useful you know like for many cancers for example surgery is still the treatment yep. it is the most effective thing that you can do for someone so chemotherapy for a lot of tumors hasn't progressed very much you know and, and, and these people are throwing billions of dollars at, at research into all kinds of mm. immunotherapies and and research on drugs and and progress in that area has been really slow but you know, the old surgical saying of you need cold steel to heal. Is, <laughs> I wasn't is, aware of that saying, but yeah, there we go. <laughs> it is, it is, re remains remarkably kind of constant yeah. at, over that time. So who knows? Probably, you know, we still use scalpels today, but there's a lot of other instruments that are more modern that we use. People use all sorts of things, robots and lasers and, 
you know, argon beam coagulators and you name it. And, 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 and is it more of a sort of micro vesculature operating procedures that you probably well, don't get I don't really do a lot of that stuff yeah, myself. But I mean, people do. But people do. Um, probably the thing that's influenced, that's changed most in my career has been a change to laparoscopic surgery, which yeah. is uh, keyhole surgery. Yeah. So most of the things that were done by open surgery when I when I started training to do as a superwoman, a lot of the, those things have now are now done by keyhole surgery and that's much better for patients. Yep. And, and there's all sorts of progression and technology in those lines. So kind of even smaller incisions or using robots to control the laparoscopic instruments is that's routinely done. They've got a robot here on the in the North Shore that, that, that's used for urology surgery mainly. Um, lots of other stuff like imaging techniques, you yep. know, like um, 3D um, surgery because you know normally at the moment we do laparoscopy it's on a 2D screen and yep. 3D is coming into use more and more and more right so it really guides your your well, use you of get the a bit of spatial kind of orientation yep. inside someone's abdomen or wherever you're operating and then there'll be other things that will come into play probably in the next few years like superimposing images onto the surgical field so you might have oh with glasses or something yeah, you might have like glasses that allow you to see in 3D yeah. and then on the screen it might have a, a, a superimposed um, three-dimensional image of where the tumour is that you're operating on and, mm. and the kind of blood vessels around it, you know, lighting up or so, so that you're kind of more aware of where you are in space when, you, when you're doing surgery. And there's all sorts of little kind of steps in endoscopic surgery, so more and more things are being done rather than through incisions in the abdomen, but like with a telescope going down into the into the gut. And, and you can operate it. using that from there. I don't do that particularly yeah. specifically myself, but it is a technology that's evolved a lot in yeah. the last 10 years. And so some, some of the things that that used, used to be commonly done by surgery through an incision can now be done through an endoscope without making any incisions in the patient. It's just down through the mouth and down the esophagus. And cool. Okay, let's talk about cancer specifically now, <clears throat> sure. and and probably more about how not to get cancer, which sure. is the, the show that you uh, led very well. There's also my first question about that is: is part of that when you're operating, going, hey, some of these tumours people never needed to get in the first place. Do, do, do you ever think that when you're operating? No, not really. Not uh -huh. in the heat of the operation. Yeah. Often I'm just kind of focused on the sort of progression and the steps of the surgery yeah. and doing that safely. But um, I, it is something that comes up in clinic quite a lot. And not so much for me because I kind of have this, I have a, a sense of why people get cancer, which is based in science and statistics and you know epidemiology and but patients ask that question and that's part of what motivated um, me to collaborate on on this show because it's not not uncommon for people to come into clinic and often tell them look you've got stomach cancer and I say well wh why what did I get stomach cancer I'd like yeah. you know what did I do to get this I'm only 57 or yeah. you know whatever it is and it's a question that that challenges people who have cancer yeah and, and that was confronting because there was some controversy around the name of the show, How Not to Get Cancer, because people mm. felt that that was, mm. that was unfairly blaming people who did, did have cancer for that partially being their fault. What do you make of that? Oh, yeah, well, there's a lot, a lot of things to say about that kind of mini controversy. Yeah. I mean, um, firstly, I think that it, it did seem to me that um, a lot of that stuff came up before people had watched the show. Yeah. So the main sort of critic of that name who appeared on television hadn't watched the show. <laughs> you get right. and, and, yeah, and so <laughs> and, and within the first kind of two minutes of the beginning of the show, you know, I say nobody's to blame for getting cancer. That's right, I believe you to say that. And but it is society is to blame. Well, there are lots of factors that play into that, yeah. right? You know, like I mean, say if you smoke and you get lung cancer, then you know, I guess you can look at that. I mean, you know, if you're brought up in China where, and in a household where nine out of ten people smoke, well, you know, that's a 
different sort of a scenario but it is a thing that we can it is a behavior and it is a, an influence on the risk of cancer yeah. that we can you know change and influence individually i know for sure that the biggest risk factor and we talked about this briefly before for cancer is age right yeah. so the, the older your population the more likely you, you are to get the older you are the more likely you are to get cancer and you can't stop that you can't make yourself younger there's, there's going to be not zero cancer in society as well there's probably never going to be zero cancer there's all sorts of cancers that uh, just random things right yeah so i don't know childhood lymphomas and leukemias yeah. mm. and you know um cancers in very young people who you, people can and this is part of the criticism that came out of it was that you know there were a lot of responses to the tbnz website on the thing it was like well, well this is really offensive and disgusting you're blaming people for getting cancer my wife never drank never smoked she exercised every day only eat vegetables she's still got breast cancer and it's stage four and you know you're making her feel bad well there, there are going to be cancers that can like happen that, but that, that's a statistical thing but you know the world health organization and the international agency for research on cancer and and all of these kind of huge institutions that do a lot of research into cancer the epidemiology epidemiology of cancer estimate that probably about 40 50 percent of cancers are preventable by us changing our lifestyle or the way that we eat or the or, or how we exercise or the environment that we live in right you know so so like one of the real stark examples of that is the little segment that we did on um HPV and its relationship to cervical cancer. Yeah, and that is clearly, you know, and, and cervical cancer makes up a small proportion of cancers, and it's maybe I don't know one or two percent. Yeah, but if you've got it, it's people, still a serious cancer. If you've got it, right? It's a serious cancer. It can kill you, right? Yep. And 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 if you and if you if you have an HPV vaccination, you won't get it. Right. Right. Simple so, as that. So it's just simple. And so if we had like 100% take up or probably even less than 100% take up because it will eradicate the, the virus from the population even if not everybody's vaccinated, right? Yeah. If we did that, then we could eradicate cervical cancer, Yeah. right? And so is, that's not a bad message to send, is it? Yeah. So that's a good way to not right. get cancer. Yeah. And then, But then there's other things, right? So if you don't inhale tobacco smoke into your lungs, you yeah. reduce your chance of... So 19 out of 20 lung cancers are caused by tobacco. Yeah. So some people will still get lung cancer. Yeah. Right? But, but one twentieth of what currently get it. Yeah. Yeah. And and so then we move to less certain things like diet or diet. So we know yeah. if you <clears throat> if the glucose in your blood is higher for your whole life and your insulin and your insulin like growth mm. factor are higher, mm. then you've got a an increased risk of some mm. maybe hormonal cancers. Mm. And then so you go well. Yeah, how do you manage that? Is mm. we have to eat, we don't have to smoke, so sure. you know it gets more complicated. Yeah, th those things, yeah, and, and you know you, whatever you do, you there will always be a risk, right? And and you can't live a perfect life in terms of cancer prevention and expect not to get cancer. But what you can do is reduce your risk. Yeah. And one of the really nice things about all of the things that reduce your risk of cancer is that they're generally good for all the other aspects yeah, of right. too, like your cardiovascular kind of fitness and uh, avoiding cardiovascular events and avoiding the risk of dementia and neurodegenerative diseases so so it's a, it's, a, it's a very happy story if you can think about how you apply those things in your life yep. you know like so we went to Japan and in, in, in Okinawa and Okinawa yep. is a bit of a sort of a two sided coin because people live the older generation of Okinawans live a really, really long time. Yep. You know, the guy that we interviewed there, Dr. Suzuki, he's got, you can see in the interview, he's got these files, he's got about three and a half thousand files on people who live to a hundred years old. Wow. There's a funny story, like he got sent down there from Tokyo, he's not an Okinawan himself, yep. to, as the first cardiologist to set up in the hospital and he's like, I don't no know, work. there's no work to do here because <laughs> nobody's got any cardiovascular disease and they're all living to a hundred years old, yep. what's going on? Yep. Right? And what was remarkable about that to me is that they, um, the guys there, they live a long time. But you know, and I kind of thought, if I live till I'm 80 or 90, I'm going to get prostate cancer. Yeah. You know, because that's pretty much the story yeah. in the West. Sooner or later, yeah. 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 PSA starts to creep up, yeah. and you have to go to your doctor and get the finger up the 
back passage and next minute you've You're got getting a prostate prostate and away you go yeah all that and then and because it's seemed to me kind of inevit- inevitably related to age yep. but actually their risk of cancer of prostate cancer in that, that older generation of men is really low right compared to western populations yep. and it's probably to do with their diet all the other factors that come into play in those so-called blue zones yep. like you know sense of community a sense of yep. purpose it's not going to affect your chance of prostate cancer well they yeah, yeah they, they might because it, what those things do is hold together those other aspects of of lifestyle which are you know diet yeah diet and activity predominantly yeah. I, I would think and so they're very active people they never yeah. stop working as yeah. the concept of retirement is not they don't understand that at all because they just expect yeah. to work yeah which <laughs> is, is a really interesting way that we've, we think about life very differently than that in the western world yeah you kind of you kind aspire of to retire <laughs> to aspire to retire yeah. and they aspire to kind of continue to work and stay engaged in their families and communities until they shuffle off, right? Yep. And and they have this really predominantly vegetable diet yep. and it's really rich in soy, which yep. probably has an influence on those hormonal cancers that yep. Yep. you know that we run into all the time, particularly in Western cultures, yep. colon cancer, yep. breast cancer, prostate cancer, all of those things. And you know it's very low rates and so I thought well you know that that, that actually is the proof of the pudding right yep. and and if we all kind of lived a little bit more like that yep. then then we would have lower rates of prostate cancer it wouldn't be zero it's not yep. zero in Okinawa and and so like I said to one of the people that kind of interviewed me about this criticism of the name of the show you kind of when you're trying to do something to help or creative yep. you know and you're actually trying to get people to engage in it yep. you do have to Kind of be provocative. Be a little bit provocative, but also cut corners to get across. You know, we were talking about this just before about how you can never get an epidemiologist to say something black and white. Yeah, it's always oh, there's a correlation and blah, the p value and all this sort of stuff. Well, you know, and, and I said to this interviewer, well, what should we call the show then? How to statistically reduce your risk of getting cancer? Yeah, you know, yeah, no one. Who's going to watch that? Or yeah. get like buried at six thirty on Sunday morning, and people think it's a science show, you know? Yeah. And we've really deliberately tried to stay away from that kind of overly sciencey or cerebral thing to make it because it's a tricky topic in yeah. itself. It's a dark topic, and yeah. and and to get people to engage with it, then I think you have to include some lightness and levity and even yeah. a little bit of humor yeah. and a bit of humanness in it yeah. to 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 get people to stay engaged and not just change channel or 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 switch off you know and it's the other thing you know like about the 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 sort of scariness of it is that kind of necessarily there's going to be people who react in an emotional way to yeah. a show like this yeah right why why are people so much more scared <clears throat> of cancer than say something Equally as fatal as like ischemic heart disease. I think that um, you know, even and this is kind of speaks to the next show that we are going to do, and I I don't know if I can actually mention it, but everyone's got this idea, right? I mean, many people, not everybody, but you know, like it's, it's really common for people to say, oh, you know, I just want to live till I'm eighty five. And then just die in my sleep peacefully, and you know, yeah. and this, or, the or, idea. Or, or I was thinking more heroically, to be honest, but still. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so you know that people have this idea that they're going to live fit, healthy, active, engaged lives right up until the last kind of night of their life, yeah. and then sort of drop dead quietly in their sleep. Yeah. And and cardiovascular disease kind of fits in a little bit with that. You know, have a massive stroke and. That's the end of it. And that's the end of it. And you never have to kind of go through this period of time where you are are sick or disabled. When death's hanging over you. Death's hanging over you. You're just kind of independent and happy for your whole life and then it stops suddenly. And I think people kind of think, oh yeah, well if I die of a heart attack, I'll be happy with that. But dying of cancer um, raises a whole lot of other issues, you know, like battling with it, uh, the prospect of pain, the prospect of losing um, independence, the prospect of becoming a burden to 
people you know, in your community or in your family around you having to have lots of invasive and unpleasant and medical interventions. And the side effects of those interventions. And the side effects of all those kinds of things. And so it, that's, I think, where the fear comes in. And, and, and I think many people have, have personal experience of that, you know. Like I have patients that go, and I say to them, this, like, the treatment for this cancer is chemotherapy followed by surgery followed by chemotherapy. And they go, no, nah, I'm not having chemo. Yeah. My cousin had chemo. It was horrific. Yeah. You know. And so it, the, there is a sort of uh, fear in that, that it's a complicated, grueling, mm. long way to, to suffer and then go out, which is not actually true in most cases, but... So, so what do you make of this? My um, dad has, at the moment, has metastatic prostate cancer, and mm. he he met with a similar fellow. Just uh, his son was a friend of mine who had the similar condition, and they met just only a few months ago. Mm. And this fellow was dad was just about to do some chemo, and this guy was recommended to do some chemo. He said, "No, I'm not doing chemo. I don't want my hair to fall out." And uh, I just was talking to dad the other day, and um, dad's come through his chemo. He's doing quite well, and this fellow's died. And so, you know, we sort of said, well, yeah, that's unfortunate because he's not going to be worrying about his hair now. And why do people choose that? How do you even, how do you make that decision? Well, you know, I, um, well, firstly, hair is important to people, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I know this because, like, for, for example, in, in, in weight loss surgery, one of the side effects of losing weight rapidly is that you you could get you get some hair loss, mm. and quite you know in weight loss surgery people might lose forty kilos over a period of nine or twelve months, or even more, fifty kilos perhaps. Right. And that there's always a bit of weight loss uh, hair, hair loss. loss that's associated with that, and and um, and it's remarkable how if like I'm getting consent for someone to have weight loss surgery, then I'll say that these kind of go through this long list of things which happen at a very low frequency, but you know include things like death leak, peritonitis, mm. prolonged hospitalisation, um, ICU admission, re-operation, bleeding, Goodness. clots in the legs and lungs, you know, like th- these things can happen. They happen, I mean, it's actually very safe surgery, but, you know, no surgery's got a zero risk to it. And I get to the end of this list and they'll go, yeah, but what about hair loss? Yeah. As if that is the most horrific. Yeah, you got a chance of dying in surgery, but they're more worried about the hair loss. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, people worry about their hair, and it's not for us to, I guess, decide what's important to people. Right? Yeah. So someone, if it's really important for someone not to have hair loss, and it's important enough for them to not have chemo, I suspect with this man that you've mentioned that there might have been other things behind it, not just yeah. Not, yeah. not just the hair loss, but you know, like I have lots of people who. You know, chemotherapy is not that effective for a lot of the cancers mm. that I see. Mm. And so when you get to the stage where I can't offer surgery and I say, look, I can send you on to someone who can give you palliative chemotherapy, which might give you a bit more time and reduce some of the symptoms that you have, some will just go, no, I don't want that. Yeah. Because I've got other things to do. I got better, I'd, I'd rather not be shuttling back and forth to hospital having injections of chemo, which makes me nauseous and stuff. Like, I'm kind of okay at the moment. I'm just going to get on with the things that I want to do and and accept my fate. And that's and that's admirable in many ways, isn't it? That, that hanging on to the last possible moment of your life, no matter what the quality, is that, is that a decision that you see people making? Yeah, oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. And I think people have a very, have a lot, have a, have a, have a, often have a fear of death. Yeah. And so that's one thing. And I'm basically, biologically, your organisms... We're organisms like any other kind of animal that will sub- try to survive. Yeah. You know, we'll keep fighting till the last breath, yep. usually, whether you're drowning or whether you're fighting cancer or whether yep. you're fighting an infection. But there will be a last breath. There, there will be a last breath for every single one of us, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, actually, immortality is another thing that, <laughs> that's possibly on the horizon. We were talking about technology before, yeah. I don't know, downloading your consciousness. You know, yeah. we might have cyborg grants still running around the track that's, here that's a, 200 um, years time. Yeah, which is quite a scary thought, really. Yeah, for a society. cyborg version of you yeah. would be very scary. Yeah. <laughs> so, Richard, what's good about the health system? I think we've got a very um, equitable and accessible health system. I think it's probably better than the sort of 
what's said to be the gold standard, like the NHS. You know, yeah. you, you yeah. don't need um, insurance in New Zealand to access most of the things that are uh, available in any other kind of Western country. And I think we've got a f- pretty lean health system as well. Yeah, it's, it's quite good value for money, isn't it? Especially compared to the US or something like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah the amount of money that we spend on it, I think we've got fairly modern. Um, approach like especially in my area of cancer surgery I think you know people get the same treatment here for esophagus cancer pancreas cancer that they would in any western country around the world and yeah, it's right. probably of, of a fairly high standard yeah. you know and break your leg if break your leg it's fixed you yeah. have a heart attack you'll get a stent all those kinds of things happen regularly in public and quickly and, and, and usually in a timely fashion yeah yeah okay and what's not working as well as it could so I think there's a degree of unevenness yep. of access to the health system and um, uh, that's partly for cultural and socioeconomic reasons, partly because we've got a population that's quite um, split between urban and, yep. and, and rural centres. I think the health outcomes for Māori and Pacific Island populations are much worse than they are for European populations and that's a, an area that we do poorly in. But that, that actually means quite a bit in the end, like a, a Māori male living to just a 60 or around there and you and me maybe going to somewhere into a late 70s, early 80s. So that's that's right. a lot of time to not be with your grandkids and, yeah. and yeah. It's a being part of your family. It's a huge between yeah. the life expectancy of, of the Māori and non-Māori people in New yep. Zealand that needs to be... Uh, addressed, and I mean, the, the, to be fair, like the, the, it's not entirely the health system that's responsible for that. It's the general socio-economic conditions and yeah. inequities yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the health that system. underlie it. Yeah. Um, what else? Uh, pre- prevention, I think we yeah. do poorly. You know, and it is borne out by this. You know, that there's very little. Currently, there's a lot of talk about kind of a national cancer strategy. Yeah. And there's very little talk about prevention. Yeah. Obesity. Yeah. It's a massive problem. Yeah. Right? It's just going to, uh, the potential to over, and it's already overwhelming our health systems. And there's been a lot of talk about this just very recently. And our DHB and the media is very interested in that as well. And that so much of the resources are going to go to looking after people who have, you know, who weigh 150, 160, 170 kilos. That it's mind boggling how much of that resource it's going to suck in yeah. and there doesn't seem to be a coordinated approach to preventing obesity. So what, if we invested 10% of our health budget, which would be nearly $2 billion, on preventing stuff, mm. then we'd, the trouble with that, of course, is we'd have to... Take it away from somewhere else. Absolutely. That's, yeah. And that's the problem, is it? I mean, invariably this comes down to politics. Yeah. You know, and so, you know, like, say, recently... There's this big, this big fight over uh, Pharmac not funding drugs for stage four cancer. Yeah, and so it's very politically powerful for people to get up and say, "Oh, I've got stage four, drug, uh, you know, um, breast cancer," and I've I've got a death sentence because the government's and, not and supporting me. Not supporting me. Yeah. yeah, and and a, I mean, that's very sad and tragic and really difficult, you know, for those people, but. The, those drugs can cost a hundred thousand dollars a year, and there's an opportunity cost to that because you could be yeah. spending it on. on that's other like things. that's like I don't know eight obesity operations, which yeah. will prevent cancer too. I yeah. mean, I'm not saying or, or, stop or, or, doing that, not don't give them drugs and do obesity surgery yeah. just because that's what I do. But I'm saying that you know, or, or like um, shoring up the HPV vaccination program to make yeah. sure that the that the take up rates more yeah. than ninety percent. You spend some of the money on that, then yeah. you save. More than you, absolutely. The return would be much better. Yeah. The suffering return on suffering would yeah. be much better. Yeah. And I'd be going actually. Let's spend it on stopping every school in the country getting sugar get sugar out of them. And you could absolutely do that. Right. And that would have yeah, a different yeah. Thing. yeah, absolutely right. You know, get the sugar out of schools or you, um, tax tax sugar. Yeah. But you see, that's the thing is that politically, that's where the stumbling block is because it's very hard. You know, I mean, the Cancer Society itself yeah. wheels these people out yeah. because it's such an emotional story. Yeah. It's not based on science or rational yeah. decision making. It's based on the emotional fact that somebody's facing yeah. their mortality and yeah. they could possibly have this drug, which might give them a few, Cause, cause, cause few you, extra you, months. Because right? 
you don't wake up in the morning going, thank God. Who's going to be the person to say no to that? Yeah, exactly. Politically, it's a disaster. And also, who wakes up in the morning going, thank God I haven't got cancer? Compared to the person <laughs> yeah. who has got cancer, wakes up and goes, yeah. shit, I'm going to do everything in my power to, 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 to yeah. live through this. It's a very ephemeral thing. And so it's hard to tackle yeah. politically. Yeah. And it's just like obesity too. You know, like the food companies, yeah. have unlimited marketing budgets, the alcohol companies, unlimited access and marketing budgets yeah. to promote their products yeah. and they're sort of culturally embedded. Yeah. And to make those kind of changes takes uh, a lot of um, political vision and, um, and, and risk, you know, and, and people just not prepared to... No one's standing up and saying we should actually increase the... Yeah. The, the price of alcohol, for example, yeah. which is proven over and over and over and over and over again to reduce the harm that it causes. Yeah, and 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 uh, we still let the food companies in this country, and you know, mainly actually led also by Australia, help design the food labelling systems, like the health stuff. Yeah, yeah. they're, well, they're, sort of they're running a mark. Like, oh yeah, I mean, you know, every time we say something like "I oh, eat less meat," then. Yeah, the, the sheep and dairy board will come out and yeah. with some kind of you know propaganda yeah. to counter it, and they've got way more resources to promote yeah. that. Yeah. And it, it's a very hard n- uh, nut to crack. You know, so, so people, there are approaches to this which are complicated. And you know, I'm not a public health yeah. specialist, thank goodness, because I think that we are absolutely thankless and difficult tasks. But yeah. you know, some of the work that's been done in other countries, where, for example, uh really looking deep into the transparency of the relationships between industry and politicians and how that influence works. Yeah, because that's been destructive, hasn't it? Yeah, yeah. and actually legislating to, to, to expose those links so that they are actually transparent to people so that they can be broken down. You know, there's places in Finland where they've done, yeah. you managed to transform public health bring down rates of cardiovascular disease, change the dietary yeah. uh, kind of patterns of a whole population. Yeah, right. You yeah. know, and it's, and it's worked. Yeah. You, it can be done, but it takes will, the will to do it and, and tenacity yeah. and uh, I don't know what it takes. Yeah, you know? well, I guess with the, with the other side... We don't seem to have it at the moment. Is, is the other side mm. of the problem that the US is still really the leader of the free world and their approach has been pretty much the exact opposite to this where the lobbyists outnumber the the, the public yeah. health people by 10 to 1. Well, it's I mean, it's not just the lobbyists and number out out you know outnumbering them 10 to 1. It's the budget that they yeah, are right. numbered like by I don't know 10,000 to 1. Yeah, right. I agree with that. Yeah. And and um you know, someone was just it's just related kind of humorous thing. Someone was saying me t- saying, saying to me today they're reading this kind of humorous article, you know, the Onion, which yeah. is a sort of yeah. Yeah, um, spoofy current affairs. They had a headline article. They're saying new fad diet in the US. Um, stop eating for five minutes. <laughs> 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 that uh, well, I, actually, I actually saw another one on the internet this morning, which I dare people to Google, which this guy's calling the snake diet. <laughs> he only eats snakes. No, no, no. He's saying that a snake eats a decent feed, then stops eating for ages. Yeah. Uh, he presented it in quite a. Uh, yeah. I dare people to Google it. You might, it's not pretty, but mm. the um, yeah, yeah, it's just the, again the idea of fasting. So, what about yourself? We think about doctors. We think about them. Knowing a lot about health, therefore mm. they'd be healthy. Mm. Is, is that true? Then what do you do? Oh, well, I try to um, get good sleep. I think that's sort of been influenced by yeah. um, some of the stuff that we've done on the show. I think it's really a critical thing. Yep, it's yep, like a kind that. of a baseline thing where if you can get good sleep, then you feel like doing exercise, you eat better, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Without that, it's really hard to, isn't it? Uh, I think so. Yeah. Um, I mean, I notice if I miss a night's sleep because I have to get up and, you know, do something for work or whatever, yeah. then the next day I just eat pies. You know, yeah. and I don't seem to have any control of it. Like, I'm yeah. do, do, doing it, I know it's coming, and I'm, like, I'm not having a pie today. <laughs> and then all of a sudden you're at the pie shop. I'm like, halfway through a pie. Yeah, right. It's bizarre. Yeah. The effect that it has on that sort of carb of, you know, the more craving for carbs and, yeah, and yeah, fat. Yeah, the whole um, frontal lobe engagement and turning yeah, off. Yeah, it's turned so, off. Yeah, yeah. And um, then, 
Uh, I do exercise quite a bit. Yeah. In a, in, I, so I run maybe three, four times a week. I do a little bit of yoga. Yeah. Uh, I surf when the conditions are favourable, which they haven't been for some time, actually. Yeah. And um, try and, oh, I play tennis. I'm in the yeah. point shed tennis club and yeah. all that. So Wednesday night, yeah. I only really sort of go to club night. But yeah. I really enjoy that. Um, but you've had a lifelong of... Yeah, I've been fitness. active all my oh, Yeah, it's been life something that's been part of your life and yeah. you've enjoyed it. Yeah. 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 And and probably I do more now than perhaps I have done in other times in my mm-hmm. life, but I've kind of realised the importance of it to my well-being. I start getting scratchy. If I, for some reason, work so busy or am prevented by travel or whatever from exercising for two yeah. days, I start yeah. to feel kind of irritable. And, and was that part of your right? issue when you were when you're filming How Not To Get Cancer is that you were... Uh, well, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> that, that you were, that you were, you actually had to travel. You guys travelled a lot, oh, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah. That was the most punishing part of that whole experience. Was the three week overseas shoot where we went to the United States, England, and and Europe, and it was just non-stop, non-stop. You know, and it's, it's horrific. You don't sleep very well because you're yeah. on the plane or you're in a different time zone yeah. constantly. Uh, it's just a series of airports, Ubers, hotels. 16 hour shoot days trying to track down these people just to get something to say something sensible yeah and and just feeling kind of exhausted most of the time yeah and then just doing it again and again and yeah. again and again because you've got this never ending schedule to sleep. and it kind of comes out on the show like it looks like people have said to me he said oh you had a great trip you know like it looks like I'm swanning around in Europe having yeah. a great time Venice you know? or something just you know yeah but it's like absolutely tough yeah you know and so sleeping Exercise, and I try to keep my diet in check, but probably that's the one that I struggle with the most because I do like, I like kind of fatty foods. I like pies, pies, and pies yeah, yeah. And and let the meat cake pie shop and Point Chev. Can I put a plug in for them? Yeah, you quite like those. Yeah. Steak and mussel pies. Oh, I didn't know there was such a thing as a steak, steak and, and mussel pie. Oh, steak I and didn't muscle. know until they got one from there. I have them every time. They're great. Oh, I might go there. Uh, Point there we, Chev next yeah. to the countdown. Yeah, right. <laughs> Just taking muscle pies. I like love bacon and egg pies. Yeah, I love croissants. Yeah, uh, I, I do like sweet things. You know, like I could probably easily, if I was completely off the leash, eat a packet of M and M's. You know, yeah, peanuts, chocolate, all that. And so, I, <laughs> yeah, but I mean, I try. But what ha, what I have been influenced in a positive way by the show is that I've actually cut down on the amount of meat and, and ultra processed food. I actually see that probably quite a lot more of that, and yeah. I kind of, you know. There's quite a few non-meat days in my yeah now yeah because oh, right. the next question was going to be what don't you do well I think we've you, mm. you've, you've you've automatically covered that mm. yeah. uh, so when you're alcohol probably yeah actually. alcohol I drink less alcohol but yeah. I mean I quite enjoy a drink but I mean I probably don't drink as much as I as other people do I think I hope <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know any amount of alcohol is probably not so great yeah. I actually just tried a challenge, which I thought was interesting, and with some friends of mine. So we ended up saying, "Well, for the next three weeks, we're not drinking anything." Three actually, weeks, yeah. yeah. And, and and I found it actually reasonably tough to start with, and I'd have cravings and these sorts of things, which concern me. Mm. And then after after a couple of weeks, they went away. Mm. Mm. Um, one of the guys. I think it was more of a concern to me. Like after five days, he's like, "Oh, gentlemen, I've fallen. I had to have a whiskey." I was like, "Oh." <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but, what, but what happened then is, I, I kept going for the three. So I'll, I'll make yeah. it a month. Yeah. And then I thought, okay, well, I should just do the next month as well. Yeah. Uh, and then I thought I'd do the next month as well. Yeah. And yeah. I, I thought I'd do the next month as well. And now I'm up to four months. Far out. Um, you haven't had a drink at all for four months. No, and I didn't. Yeah think I would do that for any reason um, mm. and it's just sort of kept going but I, one of the and I do like a drink mm. especially mm. these low carb beers and stuff uh, but it's just I felt so much better my sleep has been so much mm. um, better mm. and mainly because mm. you know when you drink you, you have to get from the uh, not to go to the toilet and that disrupts my sleep mm. so I, I, I mm. felt astonishingly better yeah no I was just reading an article in the Guardian about that about a week or two ago about someone who's given up alcohol and yeah found it to be so beneficial that they don't ever want to go back to it. Yeah. I, mean, I think it's quite hard to maintain that pattern of behaviour yeah. Yeah. in our social kind of yeah. environment yeah. where you'll be constantly in this sort of uh, it's constantly in front of you, you yeah, it's yeah. like if you live in the sea of donuts then you'll be eating donuts. Yeah right? which is the whole American problem isn't it mm. um, but we still probably drink too much alcohol in this country yeah, definitely yeah. Um, 
Interesting. So if you're sitting down with a patient and you're talking about lifestyle, how, how do you even put it to them and what do you say? Well, what, I don't tend you... to talk to people about their lifestyle too much yeah. because at that point when they're seeing me, it's yeah, right. like they're beyond that, that, that point. Yeah, they're getting... I mean, I do, I do touch on not smoking because there is good evidence that shows if you stop smoking even two weeks before a major operation, yeah. that it will reduce your risk of complication. Yeah. So I do have to touch on that. Yeah. But... At, you know, at that point, I, yeah. I, I've got kind of more pressing things that I need to talk yeah, right, to about. Right, right. And so I don't do a lot of um, yeah. lifestyle education yeah. as part of my job, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. And what if you what if you did? What do you reckon you'd be saying? Sleep well, eat vegetables, do low intensity exercise, and yeah. make some friends and form connections in your community to help you do that. Yeah, I've always been astonished with that community connection thing. It's like. And we did a study in our group a few years ago. We interviewed about 10,000 New Zealanders. Mm. And one of them, there was a set of questions about, do you know your neighbours? Mm. Do you talk to them? And, I, you know, there's questions no. about that. But, but no, <laughs> well, the answer is actually no. Um, com- compared to yeah. some of the European Scandinavian yeah. countries, yeah. Yeah. We, were, we were something like... Really bad. Well, we were like... In the urban places particularly. Yeah, like Auckland was the worst. Yeah. Um, Christchurch was the second worst. I barely worst. know my neighbours. Yeah. yeah. And... I was just astonished how low it was and it was quite highly associated with well-being so people who did felt yeah. better about themselves yeah, uh, yeah. Than those. we're quite good with families yeah we we're very yeah. good at connecting with our family but yeah. not our neighbours yeah yeah I have to make more of an effort with that myself yeah yeah it's worthwhile note to self yeah. <laughs> alright Richard thanks for coming yeah no pleasure yeah. it's been really nice uh, talking and thanks for doing the show yeah, yeah. And that's it. Thanks for listening to the Flippin' Health Podcast. This podcast is brought to you by Precure. Prevention is cure. If you enjoyed this podcast, please like and subscribe. If you know someone who could benefit, please share it with them. Together, we can change medicine for the better. Change medicine for good. Good.